Hello, this is Brother Samuel, and today we're going to be talking about a very hard topic. Uh, it is a topic that uh, generates much controversy, even among believers. There are differences of opinions, and um, and regardless to whatever side of the table you may be on, or whatever your view may be on this topic of Scripture, um, it seems that everyone has um, a verse to support what they believe. Um, also, this particular topic also generates controversy not just among Christians, but also Muslims and um, uh, within the um, uh, many of the Jewish religions uh, that are non-Christian. Um, also have formed an opinion uh, about this particular topic of scripture, this doctrine that is mostly or mainly taught uh, within Christianity is either accepted or rejected. And it deals with the person of Jesus Christ. It deals with his person. Um, and one of the things we have to realize is that when we go to the scriptures and we begin to zoom in on the person of Jesus Christ in relationship to scripture, scripture, the Bible, what we will discover is that Jesus is very unique. He is unique be, beyond uh, our ability to comprehend. Let me say that one more time. He is unique beyond our ability to comprehend. There is much uh, that the scripture will disclose or reveal about the person of Jesus Christ. And because sometimes we can't, in our finite minds, reconcile these distinctive glories um, that we discover in the Word of God as it relates to the person of Jesus Christ, we tend to embrace the scriptures that um, we prefer to believe in and ignore all the other scriptures uh, that we can't seem uh, to make a reconcile with the scriptures that we choose to believe in as it bears on what the scriptures reveal about the person of Jesus Christ. Now, it is important to understand that Jesus is identified by many different names and titles and subscriptions and so forth and everything throughout the whole of scripture. And the significance of these different names and titles um, bearing on the person of Jesus Christ, each, each one gives us a distinctive uh, glory, a distinctive unique glory of the person of Jesus Christ. Like for an example, you have the Son of God. That is one of the distinctive glories of the person of Jesus Christ. And the scriptures give a validation uh, or confirmation to that fact as it uh, bears on the person, Jesus Christ. He is revealed in the word of God as the son of God. Also, it is important to understand he is also called the son of man. The son of man. And that also reveals a distinctive glory uh, uh, bearing on the person, Jesus Christ, you see. Now, it's important to understand just because I can't reconcile, you see, uh, th those two distinctive revelations of Scripture as it uh, bears on the person of Jesus Christ, it doesn't make one true and it doesn't make one false. Nor does it necessarily mean that there's a contradiction going on, you see. And what we have to understand is this. <clears throat> it's like you take a diamond. A diamond. If you take a diamond, a diamond is one. And when you take a diamond and you hold it up to the light and you turn that diamond, and as it, as, as it reflects, as each facet reflects off the light, the facets that consist of that one diamond is revealing each facet has its own distinctive glory. It is the same diamond. 
So this is this is that's that's an imperfect uh, analogy, but it's the best that I can come up with right now. And that's what the scriptures teaches. It reveals a multifaceted revelation concerning the person of Jesus Christ. And because people have not understood this, when they come to the Word of God, uh, they either reject uh, uh, much of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ uh, and accept some of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ uh, and go to an extreme. You have one group that, that believes in the humanity of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they go to all the verses to confirm that position and yet they uh, uh, reject the divinity of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and they ignore all those verses that confirm his, div his divinity. Likewise, vice versa, there is a group that accept Jesus Christ, Christ's divinity. They go to all the verses to validate and to support the fact that Jesus Christ is deity, that he is God incarnate in the flesh. This is in the scriptures, my friend. And then they ignore all the scriptures uh, and uh, 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 all together that deals with the fact that he is also a he was also and is even to this day hundred percent man. Amen. Because if you study the Book of Hebrews, you will discover that uh, he is identified as a man even in glory at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> Amen. So. <clears throat> He didn't cease being a man once he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God in heaven. That's very important to understand. Alrighty. And we're going to deal with the deity of Jesus Christ. We're going to deal with the scriptures that clearly confirm um, that Jesus Christ is God. Also, it is important to note that in no wise am I deliberately ignoring the, the passages of Scripture that validate the fact that Jesus Christ is also uh, a man, 100% man. I am not uh, ignoring those passages of, passages of Scripture. I'm just not dealing with them. And that's very important to understand. It's like when you, when you, when you have a talk show and there's a particular topic that is the focal point of the discussion and someone comes in and say hey uh, you know and 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 ask the question or make a statement that's not relative to the topic that is the focal point of the discussion and the talk show host will say that's another show amen so it's important that you understand that you listen amen uh, and stay focused on the subject at hand. And I'm only going to deal with the scriptures that validate the fact that Jesus Christ is deity. That he is God. Uh, and it's important that you understand that I'm very aware of the fact that there are scriptures also that, 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 that reveals that he is the son of God. And we will touch on that somewhat in this topic. And he is the son of man. Uh, and we will also touch on that just in brief uh, as well uh, so I'm very aware of that I'm very aware that 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 there's a clear distinction being made in Scripture uh, as it bears on the person of Jesus Christ uh, and God the Father and yet at the same time it is also evident in Scripture that uh, the Father and the Son in essence in 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 their very essence when I say essence, I'm speaking to the very life. I'm speaking to the very nature um, uh, of who they are. Uh, in that sense, they are both the one God who made heaven and earth. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm not uh, uh, in no wise unaware of the passages where Jesus prayed to the Father, <laughs> you know, and the Father was in heaven. Uh, and, 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 you know, an argument is made that, well, if he's God, then who is he praying to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, that's your logical mind, your finite mind that can't seem to get a hold on the fact that Jesus Christ, uh, uh, for lack of a better phrase, is a diamond. He's a diamond. 
there is a multifaceted revelation uh, uh, regarding the person of Jesus Christ uh, when we come to the Word of God, when we come to the Scriptures, and, and we begin to learn what the Word of God discloses and reveal to us about the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and, and because you don't understand that, you reject it, you see. But you have to understand that, that this is the most awesome, uh, uh, miraculous work of God the Father ever put forth. Uh, uh, it is greater than creation itself. Are you listening to me? That's why Paul said that I am not ashamed of the gospel of what? Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. For it is. That is the gospel of what? Jesus Christ is the power. This gospel is the good news. And it disclosed and it reveals Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. It reveals Jesus Christ as the sacri as the, as a sin offering for the world. It reveals Jesus Christ as the hope of glory. It reveals Jesus Christ as the Son of Man and the Son of God. It reveals Jesus Christ as the Redeemer, as the Savior. Are you listening to me? It reveals Jesus Christ as a man. It reveals Jesus Christ as deity. I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and give scriptural validation to validate all of these aspects of Christ's glory. Amen. So that's important to understand. Amen. And before we move into this, I want to address some arguments that are made by uh, non-Christian groups, religious groups, such as uh, Muslims or uh Islamic groups, um, uh, Jewish religions, who reject uh, Jesus, uh, re who reject much of what the Bible reveals, especially in the New Testament, about the person of Jesus Christ, and many of them reject the fact that He is the Son of God. Amen. They reject they reject the fact that He is deity, that He is God, and their whole argument is from the from the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you how. Uh, they uh, take certain passages out of context, not realizing that they're taking the passage out of context. They're just simply uh, 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 regurgitating what they have uh, been taught, what they have been schooled to do. And uh, let's look at uh, Numbers. Let's go to the book of Numbers. Let's go to the book of Numbers. Alrighty. Alrighty. This is a verse of scripture. Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19. This is a scripture that is employed by um, uh, Jewish religions who accept, who reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Who reject the whole idea of him being God incarnate in the flesh. To them it seems to be somewhat blasphemous. Or disrespectful to God. To identify God as a man. And they can't seem to reconcile all of these different revelations. That is uh, revealed especially in the New Testament. And the Old Testament validates it. It confirms it as well. Um, to be so. Uh, and it says in Numbers 23 and 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man. And they start right there and they argue that God is not a man. And then it says, nor is he, nor is he the son of man. Well, when you go to the New Testament, Jesus, that's one of the titles that's given to Jesus, uh, the son of man. So, this is their way of debunking what is revealed in the New Testament by saying, by going to this verse right here and reading the first part of it, reading the first part of it, and then making a case, making an argument based on a partial quote of a verse. 
a partial quote of a verse. I can show you in the Bible where the Bible says there is no God. But if you read the whole thing, it says the fool had said in his heart that there is no God. Amen. Are you listening to me? All righty. So what is he talking about? God is not a man that he should lie. That's very important. Because there is a distinction being made here between the character of God and the character of man. He is saying that man is prone to break his promises. Man is prone to change his mind. And God is not like that. And so when he goes on to say neither the son of man, he's talking about the descendants, the offspring of man. See, He's talking about the fact that God is not like man and his offspring who tends to make promises and don't make good on them. Let's read and you will see as we read more of this verse exactly what is being communicated here. Amen. And bear in mind this is being spoken by a soothsayer named Bellum. And if you read the story, uh, 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 the, the Lord is using this soothsayer. The Lord is using this soothsayer. Amen. Uh, that becomes evident when you look at the context. All right. And he's talking to the king, one of the Gentile, one of the one of the Gentile kings in the land of Canaan, concerning the children of Israel. He wanted, he employed the the soothsayer to curse the children of Israel. But every time uh, 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 Bellum tried to curse him, the word of the Lord uh, was put into his mouth, and he 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 blessed him instead of cursing them. And so. Again, as we read, it says that he should repent. That's the continuation. That means to change his mind. Now watch what it says. As he said, that is God, and shall he not do it? There it is right there. You see. It says, or hath he spoken, and shall he not make good? Mm. See, these are rhetorical questions, my friend. Questions that answer themselves. Questions that doesn't require you to answer but require you to think. You see, they are connected to a statement made about God or a contrast or a comparison that is being made about God and man and his offspring. You see, this in no wise can be used as an argument to discredit Jesus Christ as God, you know, simply because the New Testament do reveal that Jesus Christ was a man, that he is identified as the son of man. You see, this can't be used to debunk that revelation of Scripture, amen, of the New Testament, amen. And then the soothsayer goes on in verse 20, he says, Behold, I have received commandments to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse. He's saying to this king who employed him, who solicited him for money to curse the children of Israel, he says, Hey, you know, uh, I have received a commandment. God has, has set up a law. And this law involves a blessing concerning these people, Israel. And I can't come behind the one who has set up this law to bless them and then turn around and curse them. I can't do it. You see, he won't allow me to do that. I can't reverse what he has said. You see, this is dealing with the integrity of God. The fact that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent or change his mind, if he said something, he's going to do it. If he promised it, he's going to perform it. That's what this is talking about. And this cannot be used as an argument to discredit the New Testament revelation of Jesus Christ as God, because the New Testament do identify Jesus Christ as a man, and he is also identified um, as uh, uh, the Son of Man. So is and it's and here's another passage of scripture that they also employ likewise to do the same thing. And it's found in Hosea chapter eleven, verse nine, it says, I will I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. Now that's very important that you catch a catch a hold of that first statement because context is important to, to when you interpret scripture, you see. It says, I will not return and destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. For I am God and not man. 
And then they stop and say, well, see, God is not man, you see. When, again, what we have here is, is, is a contrast between God and man as it relates to the fact that God is faithful to make good on all of his promises, on his word, period. That's what it's talking about. If you read on, it says, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not, he says, I will not enter into the city. You see that right there? And what this is dealing with is the fact that God will have compassion toward Israel. See, when he's talking about the fact that when, when, when you have broken man's law, man is not going to show you any mercy. However, when you break God's law, God is, uh, is, is prone, or God in his very nature prefers to show you compassion over uh, his justice because he's merciful. That's what this is talking about, my friend. It's not a, it's not a case that can be made to prove that, that Jesus Christ is not God. You see, context is very important. And see, this is a, a classical case of what is called eisegesis, where the interpreter forces his belief, forces her belief on a passage, amen, a view or a private interpretation on a passage, the passage itself does not reveal that information. Are you listening to me? Now, now we have another question that's very important because, see, you, you know, if you think that it's sacrilegious or blasphemous to identify God as a man, then the Bible itself, especially the Old Testament, amen, of which most uh, Jewish religions and, and um, uh, Islamic religions accept as the inspired word of God, the Old Testament. So if you, if you, if you say that it is sacrilegious to say that God is, to identify God as a man, as he is de described in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ, then the Bible is guilty. The Bible say, that you say you believe in, the Old Testament is also guilty of being sacrilegious. Let's go and let's examine over in, uh, let's look at the New Testament first. Let's go over to John chapter, uh, John chapter 3, verse 8. And let's look at a at a at a uh, at a uh, conversation that took place between Jesus and the Jews uh, at the time of his earthly ministry when he was here on the earth in his flesh uh, as a man. And let's look at a conversation that took place between uh, Jesus and these Jewish people. It says right here. Um, in verse 48, it says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil? They're accusing him of being a Samaritan and having a devil, of being possessed. And verse 49 says, And Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father. Now that's very important to understand because see, Jesus is identifying God as, as his father. You see, and we're going to learn as we continue in this lesson that the Jews understood that claim as identifying with deity. Because to say that you're someone's son, you're simply saying that I possess, in essence, everything that person consists of. Just like my son, who is my offspring, is just as much human has all of the essence of what a human is, all that what a human consists of, all the qualities, the traits, and everything is passed on to my son, you see. Amen. So the Jews understood exactly what Jesus meant when he said that he was the Son of God, and we will see that as we continue in this uh, particular lesson. Amen. Now, Verse 49, again, for the sake of clarity, 
Jesus answered, I have not I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do not, and ye do dishonor me. Mm -hmm. Verse 50 says, And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. You see. Then said the Jews un, uh, unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. In other words, you said that those who keep your saying shall never see death. Now we know that you are devil because Abraham is dead. You see. They didn't understand that he wasn't talking about physical death. But he was talking about the second death mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Amen. Verse 14 and 15 where it talks about the uh, 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 hell and, uh, and, and Hades being cast into the lake of fire. Hell and the grave being cast into the lake of fire. And then he says, and this is the second death. See, he was talking about a spiritual death, my friend. Amen. The death of the of the soul, you see. See, they thinking like physical, you see. And they knew that Abraham, they had the record, they had the scriptures. Uh, God gave Moses a revelation of the beginning, gave him a revelation of all those who 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 lived before him. Uh, uh, the book of Genesis is a revelation. Moses wasn't born in the beginning, but he but he penned by inspiration of the Spirit, the book of Genesis. He wasn't at that time. He received it by revelation, you see. And it was a part of their history. Amen. The, these Jewish people here. And so they, they bring it out to Jesus. They say, wait a minute. You know, hey, what's up, dude? Abraham's dead. It, it says, then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep thou sayings, he shall never taste death. You see that right there? Verse 53. He says, Art thou greater than our father Abraham? Are you greater than him? You see. Which is dead. And the prophets are dead. Are you greater than Abraham and the prophets? And they're dead. You see. Whom makest thou self? Listen. Whom makest thou self? Who do you think you are? You see. Verse 54 says, Then Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my father, if I honor myself, my honoring is, 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 is not. Excuse me, let me read that again. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. See, Jesus is steadily identifying God as his father. They hear him. That is offensive to them, you see. And then he says that he, that he is your God. That's your confession. Watch this now. Verse 55 says, Yet ye have not known him. They had the scriptures, but Jesus said that they didn't know him. So it's possible to have the scriptures and not know God. <laughs> we have it right here. It says, it says um, And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. You see. In other words, if I say that I don't know him, then that makes me a liar like you because you claim to know him and you don't. So therefore, when you say you do, you a liar. That's what Jesus is saying here. Then it goes on to say, but I know him and keep his sayings. See. So that's the difference between me and you is that I know him and I keep his sayings you claim to know him, and you don't keep his sayings, though you have his sayings. You see. Verse 56 says, Your father Abraham rejoiced. Now watch this next statement. This is very important. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. When did he see his day? Now notice what the Jews said after he made this statement. In verse 57, it says, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art yet 50 years old. They understood exactly what he was saying. You see. There was no translation discrepancy here. They understood exactly what he was saying. Because he said exactly what he meant. You see. He says thou art yet 50 years old. 
are not even 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? See, because they understood that Jesus was saying that Abraham saw him. You see, they understood that. You see that right there? And then it says in verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham, I am. Before Abraham was, I, I, I am, I was there. I was there in the beginning before there ever was an Abraham. You know, and then they was like, wow, this dude right here is, is blaspheming. And I notice how they responded in verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, and he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, let's bag up to verse 56 again. Amen. Let a foundation for Genesis chapter 18. For those of you who, who have a problem with, with God being a man. Amen. God being a man. You know, you have people that will say, yeah, he can become a man if he choose to, but he didn't. Okay, well, the scriptures say otherwise. Amen. Whether you accept it or not. And not just not does not not only do it reveals it in the New Testament, but it reveals it in the Old Testament as well, my friend. And so this is the key right here. Verse 56, John 8. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And verse 57 says, Then said the Jews to him, Art thou yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. So let's go over to Genesis chapter 18 and let's examine uh, uh, when did Abraham see Jesus? <laughs> Amen. Because see, Jesus is clearly identified as Lord. And we're told in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God, God is described as Lord. Jesus is described as Lord, you see. Now, it says right here in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Now, that's very important for you to know. Some of us, we read that and we read right over it. We identify with the fact that the Lord appeared to Abraham. But we don't pay attention to details. And it becomes evident that we don't pay attention to details when we run to passages like Numbers 23, 19, Hosea 11 and 9 and say God is not a man quoting those passages out of context in order to discredit the New Testament teachings that Jesus Christ is God trying to prove that he's not God because the New Testament describes him as being a man and the New Testament ascribes to him the title, the son of man, you see. So let's go down to verse 2 and let's read. It says, and he lifted up his eyes, that, that is Abraham, and he looked and lo, three men. Now I want you to let that phrase right there sink in, three men. Because one of these three men is the Lord himself. Amen? Three men. Are you listening to me? Glory to God in heaven. Now, let's read on. It says, Lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, notice what Abraham said when he addressed these three men. Because one of these men was the Lord. God was manifested in the flesh to Abraham. He was revealed in the flesh to Abraham. So what is the big deal that God, if he chooses to uh, to give forth a sign that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son with no help of uh, with no help from a man, amen, in uh, in 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 impregnate, impregnating this, this virgin. Amen. That's mentioned in Isaiah chapter uh, 7 verse 14. Amen. Uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 9 uh, verse 6. Amen. So it's prophesied in scripture, my friend, that God would 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 be 
uh, that God would come into the world as a babe and, 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 and as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and offer himself as a sacrifice uh, to atone for the sins of all mankind. There is no greater love, my friend, than a man lay down his life for his friend. This was God's way of demonstrating to the whole world, this is how much I love you, that I'm willing to, to, to take on uh, uh, your form uh, in every sense of the word, yet without sin, and, and live up to my expectation, and then, and, then and then supply myself as a sacrifice in the person of my son to demonstrate how much I love you, amen, that you might believe and be reconciled to me again. Are you listening to me? Watch this now in verse 3. He says, and this is Abraham, and said, my Lord. Now pay attention to that phrase, Lord. Abraham addressed one of these men as Lord. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, for thou servant, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet. Wash your feet? They had feet, you see. This is God manifested in the flesh. This is God revealed in the flesh. Abraham, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. He saw it. Well, here it is right here, my friend. Here it is right here. Right here in your, the portion of the Bible that you accept, that is inspired of God. Here it is right here. And it says, and the rest of, uh, 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 and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse 5, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore ye come to your servant. And they said, do so do as thou hast said. Verse 6 says, and Abraham hastened uh, into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three uh, measures of meal uh, knitted, knitted. And make cakes upon the heart. Verse 7 says, And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf. Oh, this is meat, my friend. God is about to eat some meat. God is about to eat some meat. Think about that one. <laughs> Glory to God. You got to have a mouth. You got to have teeth to chew it. You got to have a, a, a you have to you have to have everything you take in order to eat meat and to swallow it for it to go into your belly, you see. So this is a this is God in the flesh, you see. And it says right here, and fetch a calf tender and good, and give it unto a young man, and hasten to dress it or cook it. And he took butter and milk. Oh God, a butter and milk. <laughs> Are you listening to me? And set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they did eat. Now it is right there, my friend. He says, and, and, and they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Have a son. Amen. So God is talking to Abraham about a promise uh, that he had made to Abraham. And he's talking to him, and he's reminding him of that promise. And he's sharing with him that uh, the, the Sarah is going to be the one that's going to give birth to this uh, son. Are you listening to me? Listen to what I'm saying. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go over to verse 16. Watch this now. And this is when Abraham pleads for Sodom. And it says in verse 16, And the men, referring to the three men, of which one was the Lord, rose up from hence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? See that right there? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Shall be blessed in him. My friend, this is God manifested in the flesh. Go down to verse 22. 
And the men turned their faces from, from hence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. So two of them went on to Sodom and one of them stayed. And Abraham stood before the one that stayed. And the one that stayed is being identified as the Lord. See, over here, when Jesus was having a conversation with the Jews concerning Abraham, he says, before Abraham, I am. And it was like, you're not even above 50 years old, dude. You're saying you've seen Abraham? Because of the statement he made when he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. Well, we're reading it right now in Genesis chapter 18. God was manifested in the flesh. This is not something that God has never done before. We have a record of him, of him doing it. Amen. So, when we go over to uh, chapter 19, verse 1, it says, And there came two angels. Well, that explains that the other two that, was, that, that appeared to him, the other two men that appeared to him, they were angelic spirits, you see, that had took on a human form. You see, God enabled them to take on that human form. Amen. And, 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 and the Lord himself took on a human form. This is the word of God, my friend. In other words, these angels can't take on human form if God don't enable them to take on human form. They cannot take on human form of themselves. Amen. That's very important to understand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because you got a, some confusion concerning uh, angels and, and angels going down and having sex with women, that is not in the Bible. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. And you can give me all kinds of scriptures uh, from historical uh, arguments made, uh, put into commentaries. Uh, but when we go to the scriptures, uh, I can show you otherwise where the scripture doesn't coincide with a lot of that uh, eisegesis of scripture, proper improper interpretation of those passages. Amen. And that's another subject. And I will do a subject on the identity of the sons of God. Amen. Glory to God. But not with this one. Amen. So we see here in Genesis 18 that Abraham saw the Lord. Okay. Is Jesus called the Lord as well? Absolutely, my friend. All righty. Let's go over to... Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 7 verse 14 this is a prediction a forecast that God gave to the prophet concerning a sign that he would give Amen let's go with a, a, a 7 and 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Who's going to give the sign? The Lord. And it says here, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. A virgin shall conceive. You know, I've heard some foolish arguments to, 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 uh, to discredit that this passage is referring to Jesus Christ. You know, I was listening to a black Israelite once here on YouTube who said that the word virgin can also be translated as veil, as a veil. And I was thinking, how foolish is such an argument? First of all, a veil uh, cannot conceive uh, and bring forth a, a, a child. Now you, can you imagine a veil getting pregnant? No. <laughs> Use common sense, my friend. Amen. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Manuel. Now, that's very important. The name is very important because it's, it's, it's more to, the, to this name than just, you know, like you. my name is Samuel, you know, and you call me Samuel, you see. But see, this name right here is, is more than just a name. It's really, it really means that God... And we learn in the New Testament, or if you look it up and you look up the translation of it, the meaning of it, it simply means God with us. God with us, you see. And uh, that explains what we read over here in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 
Watch what it says here. God with us. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John is talking about Jesus. He is clearly cutting through the chase and identifying Jesus Christ as the creator. If you go down to verse 10 in John chapter 1, it says, He was in the world, and, and the world was made by him. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and uh, uh, the world knew him not. You see. And that name Emmanuel simply means God is going to, God has chosen uh, to give forth a sign of a virgin conceiving and bringing forth a son. And that son is God himself incarnate in the flesh, providing a sacrifice in the person of his son, amen, to be a sin offering for the world. Are you listening to me? I've said I've said it many times. It's so awesome how that God is able to God was able to remain on the throne. Amen. And take a step off the throne and step into eternity without getting off the throne. Amen. And 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 and, and, and stepping into time and space. Amen. And provided humanity with a means of reconciliation to himself in the person of his son. Amen. And had a conversation with himself in the person of his son. And yet remained on the throne as God the Father at the same time. So you got to get out of your little bitty mind when you're talking about God, my friend. Glory to God. This is not a language that is the byproduct of a human concept. This is the language from a supernatural mindset. Amen. It's very important for you to understand that. Glory to God in heaven. It says in verse 14 of John chapter 1. It says, and the word was made flesh. Mm. And he's talking about Jesus Christ, my friend. And it says right there in the beginning, in verse 1. It says, in the beginning was, was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Amen. So, and then we go over to Isaiah chapter 9. It says in verse 6, For unto us a, a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name, and his name shall be called Wonderful. He is the Wonderful Counselor. He is the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Come on now. The Prince of Peace. Hmm. So the child that is to be born, the son that is to be given, that is to be offered up as a sacrifice, is the mighty God, the everlasting Father himself. This all coincides, my friend. This all harmonizes. There's no conflict here. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the second man mentioned over in... Let's go look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start around the 45th verse. And we're going to read 46 and 47. It says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, referring to the first man, was made a living soul, the last Adam, referring to Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit or a life-giving spirit. The first Adam, amen, Genesis 2 and 17, God formed a man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. And he was given uh, the ability to procreate. And out of that one man came um, the human race. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. However, 
uh, the, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Remember what Jesus said? He says concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, he says, except the grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it bring forth much fruit. Well, the much fruit, my friend, is 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 those of us who have who have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and has put faith in His redemptive work as sufficient to reconcile us back to the Father, uh, to exonerate us from all of our guilt uh, and the judgment that is rightly deserving to us by taking that judgment to Himself at the cross and in Faith in that, my friend, we are conceived from above. We are born of the Spirit, my friend. And and in that manner has Jesus Christ given birth to many brethren, many sons and daughters. Amen. To God. Are you listening to me? Glory to God in heaven. And it goes on to say in verse 46, it says, How be it that was not the first which is spiritual. See, Jesus, he was the first which is spiritual. Remember now, see, Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. Amen. Genesis 2.17. He was formed from the earth of the dust. God breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. When you go and you read about the account in Matthew concerning Jesus Christ, when, when, when the angel appeared to Joseph to reassure him that Mary had not been unfaithful, that her pregnancy was not the byproduct of infidelity, uh, he, he, he shared information with Joseph concerning the babe in her womb, he says, he says, the child was of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost, my friend, is the Spirit of God. Amen. Are you listening to me? Amen. Which that confirms that the Holy Spirit is dear to He is God as well. He is not an angel as some groups would have you to think. And he is not some lesser divine force or energy equated to electricity, having no intelligence and can't think and can't speak and can't make decisions because the Bible clearly reveals that the Holy Spirit has the characteristics of a personality. He speaks. He, he has emotions. He can be grieved. Uh, that's another subject. I have an entire teaching that deals with the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and also uh, his deity. And we'll get on that some other time. Amen. First things first. And so we see that Jesus, in verse 46, how be it, that was not first, which is spiritual, Jesus, but that which is natural of the earth, and afterward that which is spiritual, Jesus. Amen. Of the Holy Ghost. And then it says in verse 47, watch this now. Watch this now. The first man is of the earth, referring to Adam. Remember Genesis 2.17? And God formed man from the earth and uh, from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils. Uh, amen. And he became a living soul. And then it says the second man. Here we go. The second man. Who is the second man? Who is spiritual, he says in verse 46, of the Holy Ghost. He says the second man is the Lord from heaven. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Did you see that right there? And the second man that he's talking about, if you if you read the whole chapter, there's a lot to be learned here, my friend. But in no wise uh, does it change anything I've said as we've examined these three verses. This remained to be so. Amen. As it bears on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as it bears on the future resurrection of believers, None of that will change what I just read in these three verses. Amen. So now you can see what I'm saying. When you come at the scriptures, uh, the whole theme of scripture is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the focal point of the whole scripture. The scriptures is revealing Jesus Christ. It's revealing the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And, 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 and Jesus is like a diamond with many facets. The Word of God reveals many different distinctive glories surrounding the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. Are you listening to me? He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God. He is, the, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
He is the Messiah. Are you listening? He is Son of Man. He's all that and more, my friend. And all and the scripture validate all of these distinctive glories surrounding the person of Jesus Christ. And it's very important for you to understand that not to re accept one part and reject the other part and, the, and, 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 and ignore all the verses that reveals this distinctive glory about his person and embrace and, and, and go to an extreme with these verses. You know, um, uh, there's a group within Christianity that, that is given to the idea of, I think it's science, Christian science groups. They really zoom in on one aspect of Jesus and ignore the other aspect of him as it relates to divinity and humanity. His humanity and his divinity. You see. Are you listening to me? Glory to God. Totally ignoring the passages that validate his divinity. And zooming in on all the passages that, 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 that deals with his humanity. Both are true. Both are revealed in scripture, my friend. There's no either or. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. He is the Lord from heaven. Amen. Now, that brings us to uh, St. John chapter 20, verse 28. Now, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thomas is in disbelief. Uh, he is struggling with the whole idea uh, that has been uh, presented to him that Jesus is alive after he had uh, witnessed his cru crucifixion, knew that he was dead, uh, dead, and yet, you know, the disciples are saying, we saw him, he's alive, and he was like, wait a minute, hold on, man, I, I got to be able to, to put my, unless I see the holes in his, in his hands and, 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 and able to thrust my hand into his side where he was pierced, I'm just not going to believe that, you see. And then Jesus appeared to him, amen, and, and, and reprimanded him for his faithful, faithlessness. And it was at that moment that, 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 that Thomas realized who Jesus was. And it says right here in, in John chapter 20, verse 28, it says, And Thomas answered, and he said unto him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus didn't reprimand him for that. If Jesus wasn't the Son of, if Jesus wasn't the Son of God, if He was not God incarnate in the flesh, He was both the Son of God and God incarnate in the flesh. If He was not God incarnate in the flesh, He should have reprimanded uh, Judas. He should have, He should have uh, uh, said, "No, no, don't call me Lord. Don't do that." But He didn't. You see, verse twenty-nine says. Jesus says unto him, Thou Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Oh, thou hast believed, you see. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed, you see. Amen. So it's very apparent we have the evidence from both Old and New Testament that God is able to become a man. God gave a promise that he would become a man, amen, and that that man is Jesus Christ, God incarnate. That word incarnate means that divinity took on humanity. God, who is spirit, took on a human form. He who is intangible, he who is spirit, became visible in the person of Jesus Christ, amen. Glory to God. And here it is, this Jewish man identifying Jesus as Lord and God who knows the scriptures, he knows the scriptures, and he knows that such a statement would be blasphemous. Amen. And and he knows that it says in Deuteronomy uh, 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You see. Glory to God in heaven. It was because of the miracle of the resurrection. To see Jesus alive from the dead, there was only one conclusion. He must be and is God our Lord from heaven. Amen. Are you listening to me, my friend? I'm trying to help somebody. Glory to God in heaven. So this is a, a very powerful truth. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God.
and we will conclude with this. God bless you and have a good life.